too. You can tell me what the questions are. Thanks for sticking around, everybody. Let's uh, have a round of applause for our filmmaker. So uh, I know that you, you hinted at the intro that there was kind of a crazy production and it'll probably just we'll drop right into it. But I was really curious about how, since there was such a, like amazing chemistry with the ensemble and everything hinged on them, how did you go about assembling all of them? Uh, those are just friends that I could call up and say, come over to my house tomorrow night. We're doing something. I can't tell you what it is. Uh, there's no script. There's no crew. You just have to trust me. And wow. so they showed up. Wow, it's amazing. So it was largely improvised. Um, did, did it get shot in like, uh, like in linear order in order to like keep everything together? Yes. We call that in sequence. Thank you for that. Um, so, yeah, it's it's crazy to have like such a, a high-minded concept and have like a team of people all speaking matter-of-factly about it. So, how much did the cast know going into it, and how much were they sort of set into scenes with before everything started to kind of unravel? Yeah. So, they didn't have a script, but they each got uh, their own page of notes each day. We shot for five nights. It's just shot in my house. And uh, I would email them a page of notes that sort of gave them their general motivation for that night or a backstory, like the story where M tells about her understudy catastrophe. Um, but they didn't know what everybody else got. So they didn't know when their thing would happen or what was going to happen. So I wanted them to bash against each other. And I just sort of let it happen. I said, you know, we're going to start at the beginning. Uh, Lorraine Scafaria, who has the glasses, I said, you're going to make dinner. So I'm going to, you know, give me a list of ingredients. It'll be there, but you have to start cooking for eight people. Wow. And then, you know, the knocks at the door, they were unexpected and the plunging into darkness. They didn't know when that was going to happen. They just had to react in a, in a very real way. Wow. You have a nice house. <laughs> I wish it was mine. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions out in the audience? About the maybe the hum that's we we asked to have present as an ambient. A little thing. louder would be good. Yeah. <laughs> um, Any? Whoever you were, yes, please speak up. <laughs> okay, so so you shoot everything in sequence, but was it um just like the Yeah, the editing took months and months and months. I did a pass. Uh, it's just a huge amount of footage because you know you're only seeing a micro section of what they really did. They improvised for hours and hours and hours, and sometimes they'd go down these routes that were just you know complete dead ends. But I would let them do it just to get it out of their system, and I'd have to sort of redirect it. Um, and I had a very you know detailed treatment. I knew all the clues and all the twists and, and turns and you know, the puzzle of it. So there was a plan that I knew, they just didn't know what it was. And so in editing, there's a million different ways to get through the fun house, and I did a pass, but then we hired a real editor to come in, and for months and months, this very expensive editor made sense out of the whole thing. <laughs> uh, anybody else have any? Somebody the, the most vocal person. Uh, well, hopefully Twilight Zone comes out here, because that's what we Our only hope was when, when we started this, we said, well, it works in Twilight Zone. You know, <laughs> sometimes you just trap eight people in a, one set for a whole story. And then Ray Bradbury is very much an influence. So those two things sort of guided us. And um, the, the other influence was just, I was very frustrated working on other movies where it takes so long. You're waiting, mostly, for things to be relit or to round up actors. So my inspiration was to get rid of all of that, to get rid of the crew and to get rid of the lighting and to get rid of trailers and just have the actors there the whole time. And it's me with a camera and my DP and a camera. And that's basically it. And just shoot as much as possible. There was somebody else. Do you still have the question? Somebody that's over there. Who would be my question? What 
Okay. Just the exact same thing. Terrific. What were the things that really scared you? That scared me? Yeah. As the director? Yeah. I was, well, making it. <laughs> yeah. I, it was scary um, after the first night and wondering if it was going to be editable because I'm not watching. No, normally when you make a movie, you know, you're the director sitting in this very comfortable situation with people getting you sushi and stuff and you're watching a monitor. And in this, I don't even know what my other cameraman is shooting. So I'm just trusting that he's getting good stuff. And, you know, I'm trying to follow. And, and the reason it's out of focus mostly is because, you know, we don't, we don't rehearse it. We, I told the actors, you can go anywhere in the house that you want, anywhere that your character would go, and we'll follow you. And so I'm trying to hold the camera with one hand and, and t you know, turn the focus with one hand. And with the other hand, I'm like, you know, signaling to the, my DP or signaling to an actor to do something. So that was scary, just wondering if we got it all. Who stepped in as doppelgangers on the mic on mic action? Uh, Nicholas Brendan has a twin brother. <laughs> and I made use of it. Yeah, this, this was a whole exercise in making use of what you have. So I had a living room and I had an actor who had a twin brother. So. I got really lucky with her. You know, this all came together so quickly that we just didn't have time to really find perfect people. And I had two options of a double. Then we cast her the day before. And one was this, you know, sort of short, overweight woman. And, you know. At least she was blonde. And then this other girl who was a UCLA student who was a perfect match. So just out of two choices. Uh, unbelievable luck, yeah. Oh, my. Is this the coherent idea, or is it still the Q&A? The Q&A, yeah. Uh, the movie gets better and more coherent the more you watch it. Let me just say that. If, if you watch it three times, you will uh, be much more relaxed. <laughs> the reason I ask is like, what was my missteps? What happened to the woman in the bathtub? Well, exactly. <laughs> she, I think she made a call at the end. <laughs> ah. Well, this is a good question. I, I usually take this survey because it's, it's usually almost exactly half and half, but how many people sort of clocked that our M, the M that we're following, is holding the bottle of ketamine at the end and getting the idea of how she's going to do this to herself in the car? How, did, how, how many of you sort of got it? Yeah. So it's about half, yeah. Do you think that was about half? Slightly so, yeah. over half. It's a together crowd. Yeah. This is why you go out to dinner with somebody after watching this and you exchange notes and then you'll get the whole thing. Good luck finding a restaurant that's open. Yes. So was the yes. one that went into the bathroom was just the one that was in the trunk? Because I kind of gathered that it's two separate ones. But... Yeah, that's, a, that's intentional to be honest, is that we thought it doesn't necessarily have to be that M because certainly there's, this is happening in many places so easily another one could crawl into the house. Yeah. That's up to you, really, if you, if you think. Because somebody came up to me and said, well, that M would have had her keys on her, so if she's in the trunk, she could easily get herself out. If you have the, yeah, the modern day, yeah. Great questions, though. These are apple pie questions. I'm not supposed to answer them. Yeah. Six months later, so we had this edit that looked really good, and then we had holes because... You know, to make it what we wanted, we were missing inserts, we were missing some great close-ups, and there was one scene that I hated. So six months later, we got them back together and did reshoots, and that was way more complicated than the actual shoot, because like Loreen Scafaria, the girl with the glasses, she had changed her hair. So we had to spend on a wig that cost as much as the entire shoot the first time, and we had to get Jennifer Lopez's wig Oh my God, yeah, it's an ordeal. So, and there's, there's shots right next to each other where she's wig, not wig, wig, not wig. So, very complex, very complex reshoot, yeah. What was the military strategy consultant? Oh, that's a long story. Okay, so he's a good friend of mine who, he had the dream 
he was in iraq and he emailed me is it we went to school together and he said i had this crazy dream that we found a box and it had pictures of us the from impossible moments and that sort of sparked this idea of a story and he also was the one who kind of clued me into the whole reason like you know the, the cold war the escalating of of weapons is because we only have ourselves to imagine what the enemy is doing, and we think, well, if we're capable of it, then they must be capable of it. So therefore, we better do it first. And these are military, you know, games that get us into the predicaments we're in today. Is somebody raising their hand way in the back? It's a, yell it out, because we actually can't see you. That's cheating. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. She has to face herself. Let's just say that. She, you know, that, that's the, the story ends there because she, you know, she's the one that gave that beautiful speech in the middle. Like, wouldn't it be great to like, you know, meet yourself and see yourself? And she had, she started at this enlightened place, and of course, she has the nightmare of actually facing herself. Because uh, it's a reaction against scripted things that sound so false, you know, especially when you have eight people and you script it and everybody has this perfect piece of line after each other. People don't talk that, that way. Human beings don't interact that way. And I was craving a naturalistic speech pattern. And, uh, you know, for years and years I've been craving this, but the rule is no, you have to have a script. You can't deviate from the script. And I said, well, this is my movie. I'll do it however I want. So. We're not going to have the script to, to get in the way of that. So, did that help you lineate towards not abiding to the Schrodinger's cat's law and like saying there's only one outcome once the coherence occurs? Because it, it, it's really ultimate, obviously, but it's like you, you premise it with, like, oh, hey, you know. Yeah, well, she ended up in another reality because she forced her way in, of course. So we, most of those realities probably stayed separate, and you figure they're just off having their own, their own reality right now. But she, you know, she, we follow this M because our our rationale was this is the only reality out of millions out there where things came together in such a perfect way that forced her to leave and search out another one. You know, all these things had to come together where Mike attacked Mike and the blood and Lori screaming so that Em's boyfriend held Lori and all those things had to come together in just a specific way for this M to choose to throw it all away, leave her world or, or, or the only slice of her world that's left and just, you know, go into, the, into chance, go into the roulette wheel. We did not get money for the <laughs> We got money for the post, but that was only after I had already paid for the film out of my own pocket, shooting in my living room, yeah. Yes? Did you have a childhood obsession with comets? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> did you? <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, we, we wanted something really quick so that people didn't think we were trying to make it scientifically accurate, because this is, you know, this is all bogus, this is ridiculous. So we said, um, what's a quick way to tell the audience, don't worry about it, it's Twilight Zone, it's magic. And the comet has this history of strange, you know, it's a harbinger of strangeness. So it was a very, um, an easy way to describe it so that you didn't have to get into the science of it. It's not like Primer, where the whole movie is about the science of it. This is saying, don't worry. It's not about science, it's the Twilight Zone. Just go, go with it. Is the, is the finished product pretty much what you imagined when you first, when you first started? Yeah, you know, it's so much better. 
because the actors brought so many cool things that I didn't think of and, and so many funny lines and so many interesting quirks to it. Um, and because I knew it was improv, I did not have a vision of how it's gonna be. And normally as a director, you're in hell the whole time because it doesn't match your vision. And this is probably one of the only times where you know, you're not in hell because it's, you, you didn't have an expectation and it's great. Whatever they brought, you're just happy with. That comment, yeah, that's bogus too, because comments don't break up in the atmosphere. That's that's crazy. That's yeah, it's ridiculous. That was actually okay. I'll tell you a quick story just about. We have no special effects in this whole movie, including the comment. That's a real shot of a Japanese spacecraft breaking up in the atmosphere, and we searched and searched and searched online, and we're thinking, oh my God, we're going to have to, you know spend as much money as the entire shoot just to get this visual effects done. And we saw this crazy little YouTube thing that was looked great. It was like exactly what I was looking for, but it was really low resolution. So we tracked down, we called NASA, we called, we called SETI, trying to track down who shot this piece of, of film of this breakup. And like they connected me to the highest ranking meteor specialist in the world. He's like this, you know, really arrogant uh, Norwegian who's like, well, why are you calling me? What, what? You're making, I don't care about your movie. I, I find meteors on Earth. And he said, okay, call this guy. And he knew who had shot it. And we called the guy and said, look, we, we love that piece of footage. Is it, does it by any chance exist on slightly higher resolution? Are we thinking we could blow it up and cheat it? And he said, yeah, well, I shot it last year on this camera called the Red. Is that cool? Which is the best camera you can possibly get. He didn't even know what he had, and so it was perfect. So the money you saved on that special effect you used for J-Lo's wig. Yeah. Um, so it seems like it could, we were talking about pitches earlier, like how to, how to pitch things to people. Um, it seems it's so, it, it's open, like at the end, there's a whole trajectory that could happen. What if someone pitched, you know, a follow-up? Yeah, I'm, I'm all ears. I'm not going to figure that out. <laughs> oh, okay. So if, if you don't have any more questions, um, I'd like to once